welcome to this repotting video of my Lelia Pacavia. Now, today we're not just going to be doing a repotting. Today we are going to go from Mombasa, Kenya to Alicante. My first ever visit to Spain. And we're going to go with my dad's ship. But first of all, while I concentrate to get this orchid out of her pot, I'm just going to focus on this. And then when it comes to taking off the old roots and cleaning her up, we will start our journey. And I'm going to put timestamps in the description if you want to skip this step. And I have to get that lecca bead that has just gone rogue. A rogue lecca bead is not what the doctor ordered when you've got pups in the house. Now, ah, yes, she is rock solid in her pot. Isn't that wonderful? That means we have viable roots in here. Not only do we have new roots growing, and that's why we're going in, we've got some branching. So I'm going to have to take some care here and take my sweet time getting her out because too much bashing in the pot, also squeezing the pot to loosen the orchid up, yeah, that's probably going to also cause some damage to the velamen on the roots in the pot, and I'd like to avoid that as best as possible. So we're going to go gentle, see if we can find some gaps. Maybe she'll just pull out easily. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it because you keep me focused. Another rogue lecca bead. All righty. It's a good sign that she has a very solid pot. That means that at least some of the roots are still alive. And I don't know if I'm going to do a division, what pot size I'm going to take. We're going to have to wait and see when we get to that stage. But first of all, we have to get her out. Anything? <laughs> Anything at all? Nada. Absolutely nada. Now, my orchid is also in sheath, so I'm going to have to take that into consideration whether I'm going to be actually dividing her. I would like to see these blooms again. If I forfeit the blooms because of the repotting, well, so be it. The chances of her blooming again next year are higher. Her health is going to be maintained. Those chances are higher as well if I do this now. And seeing as she's at the edge of the pot, well, it's all good timing in my opinion. Do I have anything, anything at all you're going to give at all? There's a little bit. I'm trying to apply the hammer where there's not that many live, juicy looking roots. And I'm also stingy with my pots, so I don't want to lose them. I'm also trying to keep Lekka away from the root tips. So <laughs> a lot of considerations here. That's why I'm not diving into the story right now, because this takes a little bit of concentration and there would be gaps in my speech. There is give. We've got give, still trying to make sure I don't lose my pot. I can't get these white pots anymore. Meanwhile, in this size, I can find an alternative, but still. Are you coming? I had her soaked in CalMag. So I don't see that she should be that stubborn. Let's keep going. Really? As in really, are you going to be careful with the leaves, Nina? Okay, hmm. I'm feeling something come towards my hand here now. Could that be it? Could I just imagine that? Okay, it's the microfiber holding it back. If I can get that to pull through, la 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 la. Here we go. Yay! We got her. We got her. Awesome! Now we get to go to Alicante. Let me get situated and then we'll go to Alicante. All right, are we ready? <laughs> I hope everything is prepared here because I don't intend to move from this spot for a while. 
Okay, so orchids and stories. Orchids and stories usually comes into play when I have an orchid that I don't have to concentrate so much on when there is a root ball that I'm just cleaning. You know, it's mundane work, but I can at least, for those of you who like to watch repots, entertain with some kind of a story from out of Africa from the perspective of ninja orchids who grew up, well, born and raised in Kenya. And in this case, it is perfect. So what we're going to do as I work through this whole little quagmire here, pretty awesome, isn't it? As I work through this, we're going to go from Mombasa to Alicante, as I mentioned, using the privilege of being a captain's daughter and being on the ship ever so often. There are some experiences that happened on that one trip, but all I'm going to be doing is cutting off old roots. Once I get started also in my story, sorry for this long disclaimer, there will be background noise and you know what? We're just going to talk and work through it, okay? So I hope that's not too disturbing, right? Also, I'm focusing on old roots. There's plenty of air so far in this root ball. I may need to do a chop depending on how I can get through this part of the orchid to get out the lecker because we're doing a deep clean and a refresh. This orchid was repotted two years ago. It's time. Right, so let's get our trip going. Let's go to Alicante. In one of my orchids and stories, I mentioned the port, etc., of my dad in the old port of Mombasa. So I'm gonna link that video below because in that introduction I explain a lot, lot more. But today we are sailing with a full load of cement. But first we have to go to Diego Garcia to offload some of that cement because the Americans are building a massive, massive Indian Ocean military base. And well, guess what? They need our cement. Normally, we like to discharge the cement all in one go, simply because that makes a trip a little bit cheaper and, you know, you don't have so much mileage hauling around half a load. But we are fully loaded. However, half of it is going to Diego Garcia. And then, after we've done that stop, we go off to Alicante for the other half. Honestly, I can't remember what was going on in Alicante that needed a little load of cement, to be honest. I, do, I don't remember, but you know, that's not here nor there. I can't tell you much about Diego Garcia because it was just like an atoll coming out of the ocean and we were not allowed to go on land at all for the duration of our stay. It was all very, very supervised, as you can imagine, the Americans with their military bases, especially if there's something in development. So Diego Garcia, you know, sandy atoll. <laughs> Think Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> kind of beach and surroundings like that. And then we were off to Alicante. Now, I have always only ever been on the ship around the Indian Ocean. And we were either fully loaded or we were totally empty. But in this trip being half full, heading off to Alicante, it was super interesting because the perspective and the role of the ship was also totally different. It was more susceptible going across the Indian Ocean from Diego Garcia to the opening of the Red Sea, it was all a little bit more, um, let's just say, volatile. If you're coming down from Dubai, going to Mombasa, you're pretty much always at the coastline and you're either going with the current or against the current. You're not going across where the current and the waves are pushing you with more of a roll occurring in that instance. So this was a new experience. Not that I got seasick or anything, but it was just difficult to work on deck with these kind of conditions, with the current and the waves working against the ship and being half full. It was just weird. But you know, we have the usual wildlife. We got to see the whales again as we passed Socotra and going up into the opening of the Red Sea. One of the most exciting things about this trip for me was all the Red Sea experience and then being able to cross through the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean. That was, you know, I was really excited about that. And the Red Sea, basically, you know, you're going <laughs> left and right. You've got land that looks like slivers of sand. Sometimes, sometimes when the land would come in a little bit closer, depending on how we were sailing, you could see some, you know, camel caravans. It was super, super interesting. I was well excited about this trip. And meanwhile, I had never been to Spain. <laughs> Who'd have thunk, hey? Back then, where I would end up as an adult. But the Red Sea, calmer, 
half full, no problem whatsoever. And then we were in the basin, like in the entrance waiting to get the pilot and our turn to be able to enter the sewers canal. And that usually can take hmm, a day, two days, you spend the night there. It just turns out that our passage through the Suez Canal was at night, which was a bummer because as we came out of it, I wanted to see Alexandria and all that. And uh, yeah, passage through the Suez Canal can take up to 12, 16 hours, depending, at least back in those days. So hey, it was going to be a long night and my dad was so cool. He let me stay up. And well, the pilot came and we went off into the convoy, the slot of the ships that were in front of us and then we started to maneuver through the Suez Canal at night. Unfortunately I didn't get that much to see. It's pitch black. You can imagine Arabian Peninsula, <laughs> Sahara, um, lots of stars. <laughs> that was the added bonus. The occasional lights, that was it. I didn't get to see much at all unfortunately but it was awesome it was just awesome to be going through the pitch black everything was calm and all you saw were the lights of the ship ahead of you you know it was, it was amazing anyway obviously the eyes got a little bit tired i was allowed to sit in the captain's chair up on the bridge together with my dad and the pilot would eventually you know we would change places sometimes because um, my dad had one little pet peeve <laughs> is that the pilots would always only come to the bridge. They wouldn't really do much, you know. <clears throat> I mean, if they were so apt and effective in their job, then, you know, probably certain things wouldn't have happened, as we know, with that huge container ship that blocked the Suez Canal only just recently. But yeah, my dad didn't appreciate they liked their coffee and, you know, a little bit of small talk. It was almost like a visit as opposed to them being there working, you know. <laughs> and of course, they would sit in the captain's chair and he would be like, as part of the courtesy factor, he has nothing really he could do. But, you know, he was a little bit put off by how entitled these pilots would be if he was coming into waters <laughs> where he thought he knew better than the pilot then, and then the pilot would basically prove him right because the pilot would sit there and drink coffee doing nothing. <laughs> so when I got to sit in the captain's chair, my dad was always quite happy and he made some kinds of excuses. But, you know, little girl, first time, Suez Canal, midnight. <laughs> yeah pulling on the heartstrings. Anyway, it was awesome. But we also got into the basin where the, like the, the great lakes were. And as part of, let's say, occupational therapy <laughs> for me to get off the bridge, my dad um, also sent me down to the kitchen ever so often. And I was down there when they were starting to do like rigging up lights and hanging lights over the edge of the ship. And of course, that piqued my interest so much more than sitting up on the bridge in the dark. And we were again now in another waiting, like another queue to get through from the big basin, the collecting basin, while the traffic is coming from the Suez Canal from Alexandria down. Those of us that came from the Red Sea up, now we're waiting for that convoy to file through completely. And then it was our turn to go back up. And a pilot change, of course. But... Anyway, the, the chef was busy rigging up huge spotlights and placing them over the edge of the railing, facing down into the water. And he was starting to fish for <laughs> squid or octopus. I think it was squid, little baby squid. I couldn't believe it. They were attracted by the light. So I stayed and watched all this happening and I got to reel, like not reel, but you know, just a fishing line went overboard and we would just catch the squid and take them straight through the kitchen window that was open. And then chef would be in there cooking away, just dump them straight into the frying pan. And we would have the freshest squid ever. And some of them were supposed to go up to the bridge and some of them did, but it, it they were so small and delicious that, um, yeah, it was the first time that I actually tasted squid in that manner. Well, in any manner, 
I just couldn't believe it. And some crabs also grabbed onto the little fishing lines. Some crabs also <laughs> clamped off the fishing line and fell back into the water. But it was the most amazing night, I would say, under the stars in the basin of the Suez Canal, fishing for our dinner. <laughs> it was awesome and super fresh. You can't get any fresher than, you know, from the line into the frying pan and the whole thing would curl up and do some kind of weird yoga. And yeah, my first experience with squid. And I can tell you that I wasn't quite sure about it at the time. I was not uh, so like, mm, I must have more and more, but I was curious about the flavor. So I'm just spraying some water because, you know, it's dry, nice warm air, woohoo. Everything we want for this time of year. So I was curious about the flavor and mainly about the texture and that kept me trying another one and another one. And eventually Chef actually had time to do some aioli and some kind of dips. And of course, well, that changed the whole experience, completely changed the experience. <laughs> and it was yum. He wouldn't uh, allow me to eat it with ketchup though. Chef had his <laughs> standards. <laughs> but with the aioli, it did. And then he had some kind of other mustard kind of dip that he prepared when he went and took up everything to the bridge and fed them up there. And we just kept on fishing. So that kept me occupied for quite some time. And then it was time for us to go through the next leg of the trip through the Suez Canal to the best of my recollection. I don't know if we waited two or three hours. It was late, let's put it that way. But this whole thing with Chef down there, it made it easier to stay awake. Of course, getting back up to the bridge, um, yeah, the eyes got heavier. So I don't remember, I have to dig deep now, if I slept up there on the bridge, if I fell asleep. It is possible because I don't remember going to the cabin, sleeping there, getting up, and then we were in the Mediterranean. I kind of remember waking up and we were already not past Alexandria but we had gotten to Alexandria and we were like on our way out of the Suez Canal so yeah I think I might have fallen asleep in the captain's chair mm, don't quote me on that but I did see coming out and through Alexandria if I had gone to the cabin that would have been it I would have woken up and we'd be in the middle of the med but no anyway it was still dark but the sun was rising. Yeah, the sun was rising. So I did get to see a little bit. I was a bit cross with my dad that he didn't like wake me up when we were reaching Alexandria. So yeah, I was up at the bridge. So yep, that makes sense. Anyway, and then the sun was rising just as we were getting through the Suez Canal. And that's when I went to bed. Uh, <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, I've had my midnight snack. I'm good. Bedtime. And um, nothing really bothered me. I mean, I don't know when we were supposed to be scheduled to arrive in Alicante, but nothing was really bothering me. I slept soundly until the rolling of the ship got so bad in the med that it almost flung me out of my cot, my bed. Remember I told you in my others, orchids and stories that the hospital room, the cabin that I had when I was traveling with my dad, it would have two beds and one was up against the wall. The other one was on stilts that would swing if you unhook the latches and then you don't feel the roll of the ship. I always slept on the one that was against the wall because I loved feeling the roll of the ship when I was sleeping. It didn't bother me, but this was different. This I had never experienced before. I mean, I mean, I was getting bashed harshly against the wall and I thought, okay, fine, I'm going to go and just climb into the other bed, undo the latches and sleep in that one, which I did. Me talking about it took longer than me making the decision, if that makes sense. Yeah, so anyway, climbed into that bed, didn't care that I was messing up a second bed. <laughs> I was tired and of course it was daylight outside and uh, yeah, never mind. Anyway, moving on. So I was trying to get back to sleep thinking that, you know, being in this beautiful, let's say, bed that moves with the ship would make me fall asleep again fast and, you know, I won't even know what hit me until we 
reached Alicante, but uh, no dice. There was this massive noise. I mean, okay, at night, everything is massive, right? I mean, it's just loud. Anything that is out of the ordinary because things are so quiet, everything is just loud. But this was ridiculous. This was a clunk, clunk, and loud. Clunk, clunk. Anyway, back and forth at a certain rhythm that would kind of, you'd think you're being tortured by noise. And it wasn't a consistent noise. It was just clunk. And then you didn't know when it was going to come next, but clunk like that. It was ugh, so annoying. And it was also, well, the storm wasn't helping as well because something was raging outside. Major, major storm. And I, I don't know whether I actually went to my dad. I must have because I don't think that he came to check on me. But I think I got annoyed, like frustrated, annoyed, and I went to his cabin or something and, you know, to maybe sleep on the couch there or something. And I guess the conversation was, what are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. And I told him about this noise and I don't know what, can't sleep, you know, grumpy youngster. Now that the adventure of the night has passed, let me sleep. Don't interfere. Thank you very much. I already changed beds once and now this. Anyway, he came back to the cabin with me. I mean, not like he didn't mind me sleeping on the couch, but he wanted to know about that noise because the storm was pretty, pretty bad. And, you know, if anything was coming unhinged, he wanted to know about it. And we, he couldn't figure it out either. He checked my cabin, checked the balcony of the cabin as well. But there was nothing there that could have insinuated where this noise was coming from. And it was persistent. And it was also in tandem with the rolling of the ship. If the ship was going left, right, left, right. Again, we, we were crossing the med. We were not going with the current. The current was to the left. The way, You know, it, it was that same thing as happened in the Indian Ocean while we were going from Diego Garcia to the Red Sea. Ugh, half full. Jeez. Anyway, so with the rolling of the ship, this whole thing started to happen and it was such a reverberating noise. So my dad had kind of difficulty trying to figure out where it was coming from and eventually he could hear it louder in the spare bathroom. Well, you know, it's like a spare toilet for the officers of that floor in case it was needed. There's a There was a toilet. So there was the toilet here. There's a little hallway and then there was the door to the cabin the hospital cabin where I was at so here was like a little service toilet or I don't know what it wasn't a full-fledged bathroom but anyway so he heard the noise coming from in there more intensely and then it was just a matter of where it was coming from and I guess in that room in that little toilet bathroom kind of cubby hole there was a door a steel door which was locked and for whatever reason, I don't know what purpose that thing served. Eventually, my dad got the key for that thing, opened it up, and there was a vodka bottle. <laughs> Somebody <gasps> was in trouble. It wasn't me. <laughs> there was a vodka bottle in that cubby hole. Clearly, it was not supposed to be there. And what is it doing on the officer's floor where you had the captain's quarters, the first officer, and the first engineer, and the hospital? Huh? Whoa. Anyway, I was like, yeah. Um, back away slowly. You know, like, thanks, Dad. I'll just be over here. I'll just go back to sleep. <laughs> because I could see it in his face. He was not happy. And I was like, um, yeah, it wasn't me. Like I said, I had nothing to do with this. And I bet that somebody was really upset that somebody's stash had been found. Clearly, it was not meant to be found. So yeah, um, <laughs> don't know who it was. I don't know how it got there. I don't, I mean, if I dig deep, maybe the memory will come back. No promises. Could be a follow-up. Oh, by the way, remember when I told you about the vodka bottle? <laughs> At this point in time, I don't remember. But I do remember my dad's confusion and fury because that is kind of dangerous. Alcohol was very, very restricted 
We did sell it in the shop. We have a shop in the ship that every night it would open and people can buy little extra bits and pieces, cigarettes and all that kind of stuff, including alcohol. And you know, that wasn't a problem. It wasn't like you can't do that. It's just what was it doing there? Who was hiding a bottle where it was definitely not meant to be? And um, who was snitching sips of vodka while possibly on duty? And of course, there's not that many people on that deck, on that part of the ship, with rooms. So, an investigation, of course, had to be done. I do not know the outcome. I just know I went back to sleep and that noise had stopped. <laughs> My world was whole again. <laughs> but then, eventually, I don't know if the crossing took two days, two nights, don't remember. But eventually, we hit Alicante. And uh, let me tell you, my first impression of Spain, when I looked through the binoculars, I was like, what is this? This is Legoland. Oh, it looked horrible. Probably still does look horrible. I couldn't, I was like, all these buildings, there's so many colors, what's going on? You got one that's purple, another one that was mauve, then there was orange tucked away in there. And I'm like, what is this? Heading into Legoland, I thought we were going to Spain. You see, Kenya, I'm not saying I was living in a primitive, primitive country, but the architecture, A, was much more different, and it's not like we were all living in mud huts, but dang! I mean, I've been to Europe before. It didn't look like this. It was horrible. It was bizarre. I asked my dad, is this normal as in, is this like a theme park? Because literally, that's what it looked like. We were heading towards a theme park. <laughs> I've never seen lime green high-rise, well, high-rise for me, back in the day, high-rise. I had never seen it before. It looked awful. And I guess now, looking back, thinking back, I was staring at Benny Dorm. <laughs> Yay! Benny Dorm was my first impression of Spain. Can you believe it? <clears throat> Benny Dorm is, uh, you know, very touristy area. Lots of discos, lots of nightlife and lots of beer and lots of nationalities that come for the purpose of partying and beer on the beach excessively all day, all night, sleep on the beach at night, keep drinking for breakfast, that kind of atmosphere. <laughs> it was horrible. I was like, I don't want, I don't like this place. I don't know. But it turns out that Alicante was pretty cool when my dad took me to certain places in Alicante away from the hustle and bustle of the tourist areas. And uh, that was pretty easy to get away from because Benidorm apparently is just a strip of land on the beach and it just extends for miles and miles and miles. But having said all that, it wasn't as obviously as developed as it is now but it was developed enough for me to go, yeah, no, this is, this is horrible. But we went into the castle there, of course, Spanish town, castle on the hill, had to go there. Dad took us up there. It was really, really cool. And then we saw people swimming in the beach and I was like, can we go swimming? Can we go swimming? Can we go? And my dad was like, no, he wasn't reluctant, but it was like, really, should we, Ugh. you know? as dads would be, tried to probably tell me, maybe not, but we went swimming. Well, I went swimming. My dad didn't. And I was happy to be in the water coming from Africa, as you do. And well, yuck. <laughs> I'm going to sound like a spoiled brat. I really am. Yuck times gazillion yuck. I was swimming in that water and I smelt all the sun lotion the tourists had on the surface of the water. Mind you, I have never smelt something like that in Kenya before. We did have tourists in Kenya, but we did not have mass tourism in Kenya, so it wasn't the same. My Indian Ocean water did not smell of Hawaiian Tropic or coconut oil for that matter. It was gross. It was gross. And then if you looked with your eye level across like the water surface, you could see, oh, you know, the rainbow color of oil. Mm. Yeah, it was disgusting. I don't think I lasted very long. I like to dive and be in the water and I don't know what, but I had to 
what, lower my head through that gunk before I get... No. I had honestly never smelt salt water that had the aroma, like I said, of coconut oil, Hawaiian tropping, and all this other stuff that gets applied to bodies. No, it was yuck. So anyway, I guess my, my dad was pretty happy that that stint didn't last very long. <laughs> he he kind of got his way. <laughs> Oh, but anyway, yeah, then we went shopping and I got myself, as you do, one of these little flamenco dancing dolls. I'm still around. Every time I see a little souvenir shop here in the streets where I'm at, <laughs> I am reminded of that little flamenco doll that I got. And I guess my dad bought several others, thinking that possibly my mom would like one. I don't know how that went down. I wasn't there, but I got myself one of those little souvenir dolls with her pretty, pretty long flamenco dress. And then we went for dinner. What a big, busy day that was. <laughs> dinner and a show, no, just kidding. It was just dinner, but it was the first experience that I had at a tapas bar. And what a tapas bar it was. <laughs> Health and safety, you can forget it. Forget it. We were sitting, no, wrong. We were standing at the bar who cares back then that there's an 11 or 12 year old standing at the bar and people are getting served beers and all that stuff. Not a problem whatsoever. <laughs> and then we could choose the food. I'd never seen anything like it. We could choose the food that was in front of us, obviously in the little glass, you know, display things and everything was alive. <laughs> now I'm not squeamish when it comes to food. I've eaten some very strange things. Don't know if I should share that here, but you know, I've fried my locusts in electrical sockets. I have fried flying ants and sprinkled them on top of scrambled eggs. And you know, as you do. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so I wasn't opposed to seeing anything alive, but I was, I had actually not eaten anything alive. Like, put it in my mouth alive. Wrong. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> hold that thought. <laughs> I have. I have almost choked, but it was a, it was a fun game. Um, fun. Put in an alive flying ant and see how long you can keep it on your tongue without it either crawling down your throat or you getting a gag reflex. <laughs> Those kind of games. But anyway, let's just say I haven't actually eaten something alive that was still moving and then, you know, it was presented on a plate with some lettuce. <laughs> and bon appétit, off you go. My oyster days had not started yet. But anyway, my dad ordered some of these uh, clams. They were, they were there. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. But they didn't look alive, so that was okay. Except when he puts on dabs of Tabasco. My dad loves everything spicy, a lot of spicy. He loves it and he would, yeah. <laughs> and what happened next was this poor clam. Whoa, the tentacles went up, ding! Like, you know, being in touch with the Tabasco. Poor thing, burning its mucus there. And oh my goodness, it was just, oh, dad. And then he just gobbled it up. Oh, dad! <laughs> He's like, nom, 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 chomping away on this clam. And I'm like, dad, for real? Oh, my goodness. And it wasn't just one. No, here's another one. Here, would you like to try one? And I was, like I said, not a picky eater. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm good, thanks. He said, you can do it with lemon. You don't have to use the Tabasco. I said, I'm good. It's fine. <laughs> I don't. No, thank you. You know, I don't know what I ate. I don't remember what I ate, but I know I did not eat those clams. Those poor little suckers, man. Oh, and he was just in heaven. He was, mm, this is this is good. Mm, this is sehr lecker. <laughs> das schmeckt. Mm, si, si, si. Dos mas. <laughs> like, ah. But we're not done yet because, you know, napkins, wipe your hands and eat something else. Everything went on the floor. There was like a trough. So there was the bar and everything on the on the bottom, whatever you had on your plate, be it clamshells, I don't know what else other people were eating, the little scampies, this prawns, all the shells out of that. Oh, and sucking the juices out of the head of the prawns. I hope I'm not putting anybody off their dinner here, but it was just like, 
all the garbage, including paper napkins, on the floor. So I was piling my little things up on my plate, you know, and my dad was like, no, throw it on the floor. I'm like, what? <laughs> Since when? Since when? No, no, it's okay. Throw it on the floor. Throw it, throw it into the trough there. And I'm okay. He says, just don't do this at home. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it was so funny. For me, it was like, really? And then I, of course, took it to town and I was putting things throwing things on the floor by my feet into this trough. Like I said, health and safety? Yeah. I don't think those kinds of tapa bars would be permitted in this day and age anymore. But back then, it was quite the adventure. So yeah, that, my friends, was my first experience of Spain. My stormy night through the med. And all of that while I was picking away in my leca here trying to get the roots untangled, trying to keep them as safe as possible. And uh, yeah, it's taking longer than the story took. So I'm going to end the story here and now, and I'm going to continue with my cleanup, which is going to take me a little while longer. And then I'll see you when I've done cleaning up and potting up, if you would be so inclined to join me. I appreciate if you stuck around to this point. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to get this sorted out and I'll be back. Okay, an hour and a half later. <laughs> Here we are. The orchid is over there pretty clean. I tried to work around the support, but I didn't want to do too much damage. I needed a deep clean, so I cut the support out. And I'm just wondering if anybody is interested because I continued to film while I was cleaning the root ball. No commentary, nothing. But I was wondering, should I upload that footage as like bonus footage for those of us that really like to see people peel away that their orchids? Just let me know because I've got it. It just needs an upload and it's just me picking away at the lecker bit by bit, systematically, cleaning out the entire center of the root ball to get it looking like this from what we saw earlier. So if you're interested, I can upload that footage, raw footage, not much editing, and maybe I can put some instructions in the commentary. But first of all, I need to know if you're interested. But yeah, so what had happened with this orchid a while ago, the last time I addressed her, all I did was up pot her and you can see the sectioning off here. So that happened and I left the support in as it was and I made sure that I would raised the support and the entire orchid up on another bed of leca and you can see the secondary layer right here. So that was the root growth in the last two years. But deep clean means deep clean and we went in pretty pretty deep to get out as much of the dead that there was in here. Of course I've got one little strand I didn't see before. I'm just going to leave it now because otherwise we were going to be here when it turns dark. Anyway, I think I was okay with the root tips here. No guarantees. It was quite the arduous job, but oh, they're looking good. Time will tell. So while I was preparing everything for the pot, the new pot, we're going up a size. Excuse me. You see, in the meantime, while I was... In the mean, <laughs> in the meantime, while I was working, I put Siliano outside. He's in his jungle gym, and he just screeched away at another bird trying to encroach on his territory. Yeah, sorry for that interruption. Okay, next step. Don't want to rush it now that we've come this far. What I want to do is make sure I get my pot filled with water. All those nooks and crannies of that root network now need to be filled in with leca and the easiest job I can do it is by using a submerged potting up method. Leca goes in, root ball goes in, leca goes in and hopefully distributes evenly around all the gaps. Not get ahead of ourselves. I may need to take some of this leca out but Let's see how we're going here with the orchid. And I wonder if she is going to bloom. So you see that is way too high. Yeah, she can literally sit at the bottom. She doesn't need Lekka at the base. 
she can rest right at the bottom of that pot. I don't know if I mentioned I'm going one size up. And if I have to do this again next year, that's fine. Ideally, I would like to wait two years. That would be great, as was the case now. The root system seems to be vigorous enough. It can hold a two-year period in the same pot. So we can eliminate the loop. And let's just submerge the pot one more time. That's better. Still a bit too high for my liking with this growth. See that root system is up in the air. How strange. Considering that the other pot was smaller, and of course, with that, it was also shallower. Huh. What you doing, Lelia Pacavia? What you doing? Where are you headed? And then, the idea being, just to keep her centered, because she has a second direction of growth back here. I think this would last me for one more year. We're going to do this again in 2023. If all goes well, of course. I have a shadow in that sheath. <laughs> okay, so in that instance, we are going to have to put the support in straight away. The support is only there for eventualities. I don't really need it for this orchid because she is already going to be pretty tight in the pot and secure in the pot. I, the support is not there for anything else unless I need it to, you know, make a presentation of the blooms. And that's where I hook a wire in. This root is pretty kinked. We'll give it a chance. So we've got that and that. All right. Time to fill her up. We've been here for hours. And I'm using large lacquer only for this one. The other pot was a mix, large and small. She was maturing from a juvenile to a blooming size orchid in the large and small mixed lacquer. Now she is mature. You can see the chunkiness of the roots. Well, that is for me large lacquer territory. And I'm going to be taking my time because this is not like you can just pour the lacquer in. It has to go in literally bead by bead to then distribute it so that it doesn't kind of, you know, catch against itself. And then I've got no opportunity of getting lecker distributed around the root ball. So once again, what a fiddle. Wouldn't it be amazing if after all this, she did end up blooming? You can see I didn't make a division. I decided against it. I wanted to see if she can handle the stress of the repot and still bloom for us. That would be amazing. So if I were to divide her, there would be no blooms for sure. Or they would be very, very short lived and of no substance at all. After the nasty spring that I've had, I want to see as many blooms come as possible. Okay, now the idea is to leave this gap right here just exposed for as long as it takes for these roots to extend themselves and go down into the media and then I can fill up with lecker afterwards. I want to keep an eye on them. Been a little bit harsh with this orchid and I wonder if I got away with making sure that those root tips were not bashed at any point in time but can't guarantee it unfortunately. Couldn't guarantee that. I was kind of looking in different directions and up through crevices, etc. <laughs> right, so the, here's the same thing. I just want to cover the roots that are over here that were covered before and that look very, very white and vulnerable. I just want to make sure that they get back into a covered position. If the back growth here starts to grow new roots, then I will definitely either expose more of this space so that the new roots can grow in or I will just fill up around them depending on what happens in the back here and that would be it. What I'm not going to do at this point in time is also I'm not filling up the reservoir with any water 
she has been in water in water and again in water <laughs> for a good part of almost three hours those roots are super saturated they've had enough give them a little bit of a respite and not because of the fact that they were cut or manhandled or anything like that just because they are drenched as is and I'm just going to give them a little bit of a rest. There is no fertilizer, nothing in here until maybe two or three days. Then I shall start filling up with a bit of fertilizer to hopefully encourage the shadow that I see in there. If we lose them, then well, never mind. At least the orchid is set for another 12 months, eh, maybe two years. <laughs> Once again, let me know if you want to see the raw footage of cleaning and doing the whole deep clean here without commentary. Be happy to post that as a separate video. If you've made it this far, I also hope that you've enjoyed the little bit of a story time. Use the timestamps to your advantage. That's what they're there for. Either way, thank you so much for watching for your time. You are so very much appreciated and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Hopefully, have yourself a beautiful day on one condition, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.